All right, happy Wednesday night. We are trying again here. We had some technical difficulties, but it looks like we're up and going now. Uh, for those of you who notice, no, I'm not Travis. You could probably tell by the glasses. Um, I'm the much better looking guy. Um, so this is Dr. Dave coming to you on Wednesday night. Uh, this is going to be kind of interesting. Uh, I preached my first sermon 37 years ago, and uh, in all those years, I believe this is the first time I've talked for this long in front of a group of people while sitting down. So we'll see what happens. A couple of people are already laughing. It's really harsh. I just want you to know. Um, so forward to this tonight. This is going to be um, a really different sort of a thing, and I'm kind of excited. Um, and so I hope everyone's having a good week so far. Um, it's, it's been an interesting week and, and, you know, they're talking about the curve maybe starting to flatten. And so maybe the, the light at the end of the tunnel is in sight and maybe it's not a train headed straight for us. So we'll see. Um, and, and I'm sure you guys could all give us interesting stories about social distancing and quarantining and all those kind of fun things. Um, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. Um, the last time I preached on a Wednesday night, uh, I was preaching, um, about Jehovah Jireh, uh, the name of God that was given to him by Abraham at Mount Moriah and in, in the book of Genesis and talked about how, um, even though historically we have called, called that name, the God who provides, um, that if you actually, if you go back to the King James, and if you look at what the words actually mean, that really what the word Jehovah Jireh means is the God who sees. God provided a ram for Abraham because he saw that Abraham was willing to give up his only son as requested. Of course, God already knew that. But in going through this exercise, Abraham was able to understand that as well. I talked about how that theme was carried forward into the New Testament in Romans 8 when um, Paul talked about those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. How God looked over the horizon and saw that we were going to serve him. And based on what he saw, he provided everything that we would need in order to accomplish what he's established for us to do. And I went on to talk about how if God's provision is based on God's foreknowledge, then this changes the nature of our prayer life. We, we often think about prayer as something that we do in order to get things from God. Um, it, it's very easy to follow this slippery slope into God is this sort of cosmic vending machine and our prayers are quarters that we drop in. And if we drop in enough quarters, then we get what we want from God. Um, and, and so th this, this notion presumes several things. One, it presumes that, that, that we know what we need, um, that we have a really good handle on what it is that we need and that God needs to be told this. Um, in order to be successful, this prayer must be done in a certain way with a certain set of attitudes um, or else it's just not going to work. Um, and then this notion of Jehovah Jireh, God who sees and provides, contradicts that idea. Instead, if God sees our situation and if his sight is perfect, then he sees situations coming that we couldn't possibly anticipate. He sees needs in our lives that we can't even begin to appreciate or expect, or maybe we're not even able to acknowledge uh, so prayer becomes less about informing God of our needs and wants and wishes and more about getting ourselves in alignment with God's will. So prayer becomes more of this exercise of communing with God and understanding who God is and what he is doing in our lives rather than, hey, God, here's my list today as we sit on Santa Claus's lap. So if, if the measure of the quality of a sermon is the amount of discussion it produces and the depth of questions that it generates, then this was by far the best sermon that I've ever preached. 
Uh, I stayed uh, long after that night having lots of conversations about prayer, discussing lots of great questions that people were bringing up, many of which I hadn't even thought of. Uh, and tonight, I'm going to address one of those questions, take some time to unpack it, and hopefully, if I do my job well, offer up some encouragement for our current situation. So I made the point that if God sees and provides based on what he sees, if he sees and provides based on what he sees, then God's provision for our needs really relies very little on our prayers. It's not saying that we shouldn't pray. It's just saying that, 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 that it's not the situation that if, if, we, if we neglect to pray for something that God's necessarily not going to give it to us. And we spent a couple of moments talking about all these things that we need on a regular basis just to live our lives that we don't even think about. We take for granted, and yet God provides them. Uh, we don't ask for them because we don't even think about them most of the time. Um, and, and, and so 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 prayer really should be less about cajoling and pestering God to get what we need and more about fixing our minds on God so that when he provides what we need, we are certain of the source of that provision. Uh, you know, Jesus talks about in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, those sorts of ongoing things that we need that we don't even think about. But it's recognizing that it comes from God because we're talking to God and we're acknowledging that whatever it is that we have in our lives that's valuable and useful has come from him. Um, but wait, someone protested. Doesn't the Bible tell us that it's only the prayer that's offered in faith that God hears and honors. Specifically, they challenged me with the notion that Jesus wasn't able to do many miracles in his hometown of Nazareth because of their lack of faith. Doesn't this suggest, they said, that our prayers and the attitude of our prayers has an effect on God's provision? Well, tonight we're going to look at that situation and another situation where an individual was praised by Christ himself for their great faith, and see if we can puzzle out what this is talking about and what it means for us. So we're going to start tonight with this positive example of faith, and that's the faith of the centurion. So that's in Luke chapter 7. So in Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, we're going to read down to verse 10. It says this, uh, when Jesus had finished saying all this, this is Jesus in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. He's been uh, up on the Mount of Olives talking about all this stuff. And if you have a red letter Bible, there's several pages of red preceding this and some other Gospels like Matthew and Mark that record more of Jesus' words. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Again, that's a city in Israel. You can go there today, um, um, an actual place. There was a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly, who was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell, one, I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So a lot has been said about this over the years. Um, a lot of people have preached on this passage, and we're going to unpack it fairly simply. First of all, notice here that the centurion wasn't a Jew. He wasn't Jewish. He was a Roman centurion, so he would have been a, a Roman citizen. Most likely, he would have been Italian, possibly Greek. Uh, we, we sometimes forget when we're reading the Bible that Rome was in Italy. It's still in Italy. And a lot of the people that are talked about in the New Testament are Italian. Um, 
the, the, we notice that he wasn't Jewish, but he was possibly a proselyte. In other words, he was possibly a Gentile convert to Judaism. While we don't know this explicitly from the text, we do know he's very friendly to the Jewish leadership. You know, and we see that here, the Jews are trying to sell this to Jesus. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So this man was involved in the daily religious life of these Jews in this area to which he was assigned um, as the leader of a hundred soldiers. That's what a centurion was. He was the commander of a hundred soldiers, and he probably uh, either reported directly to Pontius Pilate or maybe had some guy in between him and Pilate. But this is an important man in the Roman military government. Um, what we do know is that he wasn't Jewish, and therefore he wasn't looking for any sort of Messiah. He was a Jewish proselyte, so he, he, he was friendly with the, with the local Jewish leaders, and, and, and that's all we know. The second thing to notice is that he believed that Jesus was able to help him. After all, that's why he went to him. Perhaps he had heard the stories of some friends. It says that he had heard of Jesus. Uh, perhaps he had seen people healed by Jesus. Maybe even he knew someone whom Jesus had healed. All we knew for sure is that he understood who Jesus was. The third thing that we see is that the Saturian's request was based on who Jesus was and not on who he was. Notice, the Jews couched their request in who the centurion was. Um, the, the Jews said, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So they're trying to make it out like, oh, Jesus, you've got to come help this guy uh, because he's important. He's helped us, so therefore he deserves to be helped. The centurion knew better. Um, in, in Luke's telling, the centurion doesn't ever even meet with Jesus personally, thinking himself unworthy to have an audience with him. And he says that. Um, the centurion sent word to him through a friend Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. So, so this centurion understood a lot of things about Jesus. He understood that he had the ability to heal. He understood that, 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 that Jesus was someone who was, was important and not to be taken lightly. Um, he understood that his position compared to Jesus' position was nothing. And, and he even understood that, 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 that because he was a man in authority over people um, under him, that, that Jesus, because he was a healer, that he had the authority to just command his servant to be healed without even going to his house. Um, so so um, let's, let's, let's set that aside for a second and let's pivot over to Matthew chapter 13 and read the story about when Jesus um, was in his hometown of Nazareth. So this is Matthew 13, beginning in verse 53, and reading down to verse 58. So Matthew 13, 53 through 58. Uh, when Jesus had finished these parables, so again, this is, not the Sermon on the Mount. This is later. This is other parables and teachings. Uh, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. Coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. So this would have been the synagogue that Jesus grew up in. Uh, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they ask? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all of his sisters with us? Where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown and in his own house is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. In, in Mark's telling of this story, um, he, he, he sums it up by saying he could not do many miracles because of their lack of faith. And when, when, you look at the, when you look at the statement in Greek, it speaks less about ability and more about just what Jesus chose to do or not do. And so let, let's unpack 
this and using the same thinking that we did with the centurion. First of all, these people were Jewish and they were under Roman rule. So they were actively looking for their promised Messiah. Um, we don't have time to go into it tonight, but there have been multiple would-be messiahs in Palestine already by this time in the first century, and none of them pan out. If you want to, you can scan forward in the book of Acts to when Paul, when, when um, P, um, Peter and, and John have been arrested, and and. Gamaliel, who was the teacher of Paul, stands up and addresses the Sanhedrin, and he lists off some of these messiahs, would-be messiahs that had come recently, and how none of them had panned out, they'd all been killed, and all their disciples had scattered. And so they had seen these guys come and go, and in their mind, Jesus was just another one of these would-be messiahs. Um, so they were still looking for their messiah, and they were under Roman rule, and Roman rule wasn't nice at all. Um, so it's a little bit like that scene at the end of Fiddler on the Roof, where where uh, where, the, where the carpenters, uh, the, the 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 tailor, um, they're they're all gathering up their stuff because they've been run out of their village, and and the and the and, and model the tailor stands there and says, "Wouldn't now be a good time for the Messiah to come?" And every time you know the Romans came through and did something, every time Pilate issued an edict, I'm sure they were all sitting around. Wouldn't now be a good time for the Messiah to come? So they were looking for this Messiah. They were Jewish people. They were looking for this Messiah. But second, the second point here is they did not believe that Jesus was this Messiah. In fact, they thought he was just a carpenter. They watched him grow up. They knew his mom. They knew his brothers. They knew his sisters. They knew his, they knew his, his dad, the one they thought was his dad, Joseph. We don't know what happened to Joseph. Um, he just simply drops out of the story. Um, they, they knew of these miracles that Jesus had done, but when they heard his teachings, they merely considered him presumptuous. How dare he? Um, it's kind of funny. I had a similar experience as a medical student. I was, um, I was um, visiting a, a, a training program that I thought I wanted to be part of, and, and, and at the end of the month that I was there, you know, the person that was giving me my exit interview you know, had had read through my resume and had seen, you know, I've done this research and published these papers and I've gone on this research trip and been to the bottom of the ocean in Alvin and this, that, and the other. And, and, and she's like, your, your, your story is a little bit larger than life and went on to tell me how, you know, obviously my head was too big to my shoulders and I thought much too highly of myself. And I'm like, well, I mean, I didn't say any of this. I just recorded it for you to read. Um, you know, so people are interesting. They, they, we, we put people in these boxes of what we expect them to be. Um, you know, I was a medical student who was as old as this doctor who had been a doctor for 20 years. My life experiences were much broader than theirs. And, 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 and for that, they considered me presumptuous. You know, I'm sorry that I've done different things in my life. And so they're looking at Jesus saying, he's a carpenter. He grew up in this town. We know who he is. And yet he's claiming to be something else. So this is not right. He's, he's, this isn't, this isn't going to work. So, so really the third part here with this background in mind, it's pretty plain to see why Jesus didn't do that many miracles among them. They didn't believe he could. So they didn't bother to ask him. You know, to them, it just didn't cross their mind to consider that he would be someone that could do a miracle. To, to, it would be like, you know, asking me to frame the addition in your house. Or asking Jamie Osterhout to check your vision and make you some prescription for glasses. I mean, you know, I have done carpentry in my life, but you know, there's a reason I'm not a professional carpenter. And, and Jamie works with glass, but he doesn't work with glasses. And, and, and so, you know, it's just not what we do. And, and from the same perspective, you know, if they needed their house fixed or they needed a new table or something like that, sure, Jesus might have been the first guy that they called, but it wasn't, it wasn't in their th thought process to call him to have somebody healed or to understand the Torah. Um, and, and it wasn't because of what they were seeing. They saw him healing. They saw him teaching. It's because of their the mindset they were bringing to him, saying he's just the carpenter's son. And we know about Mary and Joseph. I mean, you know, they, oh yeah, right. You know, the Holy Spirit has done whatever. You know, Mary and Joseph did something they ought not have done. And so, you know, he wasn't exactly the sort of son that you talk about. Um, and, and so when Jesus made this statement, 
Um, so, so Jesus makes this statement that the centurion had greater faith than any that he had found in Israel. And then he said that the people of Nazareth didn't have any faith at all. So is there another passage of scripture that we can turn to to unpack this a little bit more? And there is. We can turn to Hebrews and chapter 11. Anytime you're talking about faith, the book of Hebrews is often a good place to go. And Hebrews chapter 11 is this, this passage that we like to refer to as the hall of fame of faith. All these people did all these amazing things because of their faith. And, and as a result of their faith, um, they, were, they were highly rewarded and are memorialized in this, in this chapter. And, and chapter 11, verse 6, makes this very interesting statement um, that's important in understanding this chapter, but it's important in understanding what we're looking at tonight. Um, verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So it, it says two things. It says, um, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe two things. Believe that God exists and believe that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. And this is what separated the centurion from the people of Nazareth. You see, the centurion understood who Jesus was. Now, that's not to say that, that, that he understood uh, the dual nature of Christ, and that he understood the incarnation, and the virgin birth, and this, that, and the other, but he knew that Jesus was an important man from God who was able to heal, and as a result, he came to him and said, I want you to do this, and I believe that you're able to do it. He believed that, he, that, that God existed and that he uh, would reward those who earnestly seek him. And so he, he was able to ask, ask Jesus to heal his servant. Furthermore, the fact that he felt himself unworthy to even make the request himself, but sent Jewish elders, he sent religious leaders who he presumed would have been friendly to Jesus, that he understood that his position meant nothing, and that, that he needed an intermediary to go between him and, and, and Jesus. So the centurion understood some things about Jesus. He didn't understand Jesus perfectly, but he understood some things about Jesus. The people of Nazareth did not understand who Jesus was. They thought he was just a simple carpenter who was making extravagant claims about himself, and they resented him for it. He offended them. And as a result, Jesus didn't heal many people there. The centurion believed who Jesus was and asked him to heal his servant. His servant was healed. The people of Nazareth did not believe Jesus was who he claimed to be, and therefore he didn't heal many people there. So how does this relate back to our topic? You see, faith is a quality. It's a property. It's not a quantity. Let me say that again. Faith is a quality. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a property. It's not a quantity. It's like redness, or the property of redness. Something either is red or it's not. Um, we can dicker about, about the shade of red we might be talking about, but at the end of the day, something is either red or it's not. Um, and in the same vein, you either have faith or you don't. See, it doesn't say in, in the passage, in either Mark or Matthew, that the folks in Nazareth didn't muster up enough faith it just says they didn't have faith. Now, we know that some people did because Jesus was able to heal a few people. So some people understood who he was. Uh, but, those who, but those that didn't, Jesus wasn't able to do anything. The centurion, however, was the opposite. He had very little reason to believe. He wasn't Jewish. He wasn't looking for a Messiah. He simply understood who Jesus was. He had faith, and that faith spurred him to action and brought about a result. You see, somewhere along the way, we've come up with this idea that faith is something that can be measured in amounts, 
and, and that in order for things to happen, you have to have a certain amount of it. And then we go around wondering whether we have enough of it to get the job done. In terms of our prayers, it sets God up as willing to grant our requests, but we have to put in the work, as it were, prior to him doing so. And if we never muster up enough faith for God to act, well, gee, that's just too bad. Um, after I preached my first sermon, Matt Johnson came up to me after and related the story to me. And I, I talked to him and got his permission to share this. Uh, when he was a, a, a young man, um, just beginning in ministry, his music pastor died of cancer. Uh, and, and the church had been praying and fasting for weeks and months and, and however long for him to be healed and not die of cancer. And he died of cancer. And when it was all said and done, um, you know, this, this, this guy came up to him afterwards and said, you know, the reason why he died is because there weren't enough people praying in faith. So it's this notion that God's sitting up there going, I'm ready to heal the guy. Oh, crap, not enough faith. Sorry. Oh, well, better luck next time. Really? Do we believe in a God like that? Do we really believe in a God that's standing there willing to do stuff, but we haven't measured up enough? We haven't put in enough works. We haven't done all the right steps for him to do that. Um, notice the issue becomes less about God's will and more about what we're doing or not doing. Another great example, I talked about this some time ago. Um, Johnny Erickson Tata had this big deal a couple of years ago where she was celebrating the 50th anniversary of her injury. Celebrating the 50th anniversary of jumping in the water and breaking her neck. Why? Because God has used that horrific moment to have a tremendous ministry in millions of people's lives. You know, some of you know I have a niece in Texas who has Down syndrome. And, and, and she, that, and my brother's family and her specifically have, have benefited greatly from the ministry of Johnny Erickson Tata and the little camps that she puts on for, for, for handicapped children and things like that. All because of that moment where she jumped in the water that was too shallow, broke her neck, blah, blah, blah. And so they're having this on, this, this on her, on, on, you know, this, this, this story is posted about her injury and the history of her ministry and this, that, and the other. And again, some guy logs in there and says, isn't it terrible that Johnny Erickson Tata hasn't had enough faith to be healed all these years? Do, do, we, do we hear the words coming out of our mouths when we say things like that? The reason Johnny Erickson Tata has had this amazing ministry for half a century is because she didn't have enough faith? I mean, it's, the, the, w w these things come out of our mouths that make absolutely no sense. If we had more faith, then we wouldn't have to suffer because God would do this and that for us. But what if that suffering were the thing that God needed to see happen in our lives to get us to the point where we're able to do the thing that he needs us to do? You know, you watch, you watch movies like I Can Only Imagine. And, and imagine what... Mercy Me's ministry would be like if, if Bart Miller hadn't gone through all those horrific things. Uh, just the other night, we watched um, the Jeremy Camp movie, I Still Believe. Um, and and you know, if, if, if he hadn't gone through that stuff with his first wife, what would his ministry look like today? At, at some point, Danny Gokey's going to have to make a movie because his story is very similar to Jeremy Camp's. Um, People go through hard things, and when you get on the other side of hard things, as we trust God with the hard things, God's able to do amazing things in our lives. When we avoid the hard things, God is not able to use those hard things to build us up, and he does less amazing things in our lives. Can I say that again? When we go through hard things and trust God through those hard things, he's able to use those hard things to build us up, so he can use us to do big things. If we don't go through those hard things, we miss God's work in our lives and he doesn't get to use us to do those things. You see, it's those things, those things in life that some of us try to avoid that God uses to build us up, to conform us into the image of Christ for his glory. See, God isn't sitting up in heaven saying, I'd love to grant that request, but you didn't say it right. 
you know, like Alex Trebek on, on Jeopardy. That's the right answer, but you didn't phrase it as a question, so it doesn't count. Uh, or, nope, not enough faith, request denied, big stamp, boom, request denied. And believe it or not, that's a good thing. The idea that God only answers our prayers if we do certain things in the right way takes glory away from God and puts it back on us. It becomes another works idea. This notion that we have to pray with the right attitude, we have to pray in faith, we have to have enough faith, is a works mentality. We have to do, we have to do, and once we do enough, God will do. It's like the, the, the Jewish leaders coming to Jesus. The centurion has done enough things, therefore he deserves to have you do this. At what point do we deserve to have God do anything for us? Let me say that again. As, as Christians who believe in salvation by grace, at what point do we deserve to have God do anything for us? That's exactly what the Jewish leaders thought about the centurion, but the centurion, this Roman pagan, understood better. Since when is anything in Christianity about earning it? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works that no one should boast. We, we, God doesn't answer our prayers because we've done enough things, we've built up enough of this kitty of faith, and all of a sudden, boom, God's able to do something because that would be us. I've done this, I've done that, therefore I deserve to have God answer my prayer. The centurion has, has valued our nation. He helped us build our synagogue. Therefore, he deserves you to do this for him, Jesus. And the centurion doesn't even deign to come into his presence because he understands better. The, the prayer of, so, so to pray in faith means to pray with the understanding that God is real and that he rewards those who seek him. You notice when the Bible talks about prayer, the only time it uses anything like a quantity to describe faith, it says, if you have faith like a mustard seed. And people have interpreted that as volume, because a mustard seed is a tiny little thing. But when you read what Jesus says about the mustard seed, it has very little to do with the size of the seed. It has to do with the fact that this tiny little seed grows this great big huge plant. You know, he says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, be removed and it'll move. I ask you, Jesus said that, you know, 1990 some years ago. Has anyone ever heard with all the great men of faith that have come in the last 1900 plus years of a mountain being moved? Are you going to tell me that no one with great faith has had enough faith to do the thing that Jesus could do? Maybe that's not what Jesus was talking about. Maybe what Jesus was talking about is that faith is not a quantity. It's not something you can have so much of, but faith is a quality that produces an action. We have faith. We believe that God is who he says he is, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him, and so we pray in faith. You don't have to be perfect. We don't have to do everything right. There's not a magical formula to memorize there's no special way of doing it. You don't have to live a perfect life. You don't have to dot so many I's or cross enough T's. All we have to do is trust that God is who he says he is and trust in his grace in our lives. See, if we really understand Jehovah Jireh, God sees our situation. He sees what we need. He understands our situation far better than we do. You know, Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, we see now darkly as in a mirror. Back then a mirror was a piece of polished brass, not these fancy mirrors like we have today. So we see darkly in this mirror. We understand in part, but God sees the whole picture. He understands fully. And so God, Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees, sees everything. He sees not just this tiny piece that we're in, but he sees the whole picture past, present, future, everything. And based on that, he provides. We sit here and pray. We're communing with God. We're trying to be one with God. We're trying to be on God's team, trying to be 
uh, aligned with his will, trying to move in the direction that he's moving, that's where our prayer life comes in. And yes, gosh, I see this thing coming, God, and, and, and I'm trusting that you're going to meet this need. It's not saying, hey, God, by the way, it may have escaped your notice that this thing is coming. I really need you to do something here. No, God, I see this thing coming. I know you've already seen it, and I'm trusting that you're going to meet this need. And I'm looking forward to what you're going to do. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, because he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees and provides. You see, as we're wrestling with all these new realities in the middle of the mess that we're in, let's not compound things by beating ourselves up over whether we have enough faith or not. Um, All God asks is that we trust him, trust that he's Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees. Just like we don't have to measure up in order to be saved, we don't have to measure up in order to pray. We don't have to have this works mentality about prayer that that we have to come with just the right attitude and we have to muster up enough faith and blah, blah, blah. We just have to trust God, believe who he is, believe what he says, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. He's Jehovah Jireh. He sees our situation. He understands what we need and provides what we need. We don't have to fully understand our situation so we can pray specifically enough for God to meet our needs. You see, God's not taking applications for answered prayers. We're not applying for a gospel grant for God to meet our needs. God's not taking boxes to make sure we're meeting all the requirements before he answers our prayers. All we need to do is trust God that he'll provide what we need when we need it, whether or not it may be what we particularly want. See, God sees and provides what we need. It has very little to do with what we want. What the want part comes when we align ourselves with God, then our wants align with, with his wants for us. We need to trust that God has our that, that God knows what he's doing and that he's in control. He understands what's going on. We need to trust that he has our best in mind, even if what's happening around us doesn't seem to make sense to us. Uh, We need to let go of the idea that we need to do more, we need to be better, we need to muster up enough faith in order for God to do stuff and somehow meet God halfway, as one author put it. Bonus points if you know who I'm talking about. And just as all we have to do is just rest in him and trust that he's got this and that God's provision is is resting on him, him seeing and understanding our situation and providing for us, not us coming into the situation and saying, God, this is what I need. Why aren't you doing this? Don't I have enough faith? Aren't I a favored enough child for you to do this for me? And you know something, that's great news because I don't know about you guys, but I've got enough to do without making sure I'm checking all these boxes for God to to be on God's A-team. Um, I've got enough to do at work. I've got enough to do um, just in my life without having one more big load on my shoulders of stuff that I've got to make sure that I'm doing right. So I hope this was as encouraging to you guys hearing it as it was in me putting it together. Um, That's what we got for Wednesday night. I don't have the fancy technology like Travis to uh, do other stuff. You're just stuck with me. So you guys have a great rest of your week. And we will see you all uh, virtually on Easter morning.